Hey, what's going on everybody? Welcome back to your C++ tutorial series. Now, if you're watching this video, you've probably gotten here from one of two ways. One, you've been watching this series from the beginning as a good boy or girl, or two, you're searching stuff about object-oriented programming in C++ because you probably weren't paying attention in class or you're failing at work and now you need me to redeem you and save your soul. Well, that's what I'm gonna try and do, but this video is going to be some review from what we talked about in previous videos. So if you have been watching the series all the way through, you can watch it if you're struggling, or you can just jump to the next video. We're gonna talk about classes and objects very similar to structs, so a lot of the same material, very similar in nature. So let's just jump in, but first you gotta check out our sponsor, Embarcadero Rad Studio. Rad Studio is the IDE of choice for C++ development. Quickly build native, mobile, and desktop applications from a single C++ codebase and deploy to Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android. With Rad Studio, user interface design has been made easy with hundreds of pre-built components for cross-platform development. You can easily integrate with popular source control management systems, databases, APIs, and you can make your life easier with numerous third-party extensions. Let Rad Studio do the heavy lifting when it comes to C++ development. Give it a go with a free trial by following the link in the description. Now, when I was just a little boy many years ago, I was talking to my neighbor. And at the time, I was studying addition in school. And I was, I was kind of getting it. I was struggling, but, you know, I figured out how to do it. You know, you could add these things together, basically represent how many of uh, things you had but he was saying how he was learning multiplication. Now, when he said this, I was upset. I was bitter because I knew as soon as I finished learning about this addition junk, I was gonna have to figure out multiplication. And I was like, what, when are we ever going to use this multiplication junk in real life? Seems like a pretty silly story, especially now looking back, I understand the value of multiplication. Well, object-oriented programming is very similar in nature. When you're learning it for the first time, you're like, ugh, what the crap is all this complexity useful for? Why do I need all this junk? But as you look back, once you understand object-oriented programming, you're thankful you put the time in to understand it. So the moral of the story is to stick with it, stay with it, because object-oriented programming can kind of be a pain in the butt when you're first learning it, but it is extremely valuable, and I'm gonna do what I can to make it nice and simple. So this video is going to go over some concepts, and then in the next video, we are going to go hands-on coding some stuff on the computer. So if you need some hands-on practice, check out the following video as well. And now, after all that blabbering, let's finally get into the concepts. Let's get started. The first thing you need to understand, what is a class? Well, a class basically defines the structure or the shape of some data. So think of it as like a cookie cutter. <laughs> like Tron Patrick or something. Okay, let me try this again. Let's do, a, let's do a tree. All right, so we made this beautiful cookie cutter and you can use this to cut cookies. <laughs> and the cookies that you create with the cookie cutter are known as objects. So here's a cookie, it kind of resembles a tree. And here's another cookie. This one didn't quite turn out quite as nice and so forth. So the process of going from a class to objects is known as instantiation. It's a pretty cool word. You can use it at the, the local hangout spot to pick up chicks. Just start talking about classes and objects and instantiation and you'll be like the ladies man, all right, trust me. Now this is kind of a silly example with cookies, but let's make it a little bit more concrete. Let's say we're trying to describe a user for our application we're building. So we would create a class such as user with a capital U, that's by convention. You can use a lowercase u if you want, but don't do that. And then the objects you can name on whatever you want because they're essentially variables. So you could say, we're going to create a variable called user with a lowercase u, and let's just call it user one and two. And I prefixed it with user because this is the type. So when you create a class, you're essentially building a new type. What? Yeah, that's right. So when you do something like int x or string y, these are all examples of types. Well, we just created our own. It's called a user. So we could say user z. And we can create functions that take that custom type or return that type. We can build vectors of this type. We can treat it as if it's any other type. And that type's functionality is defined by the class. Now I wanted to throw something out there. If you're coming from another programming language, you might see the keyword new. So you might see something like this, like so. 
And this is very common in other programming languages, but this is not the C++ way of doing it. No, you don't do this. You don't do the right half. In these other languages, this is the way to call the constructor and create a new user, but you don't do that in C++. When you just leave it as this, it'll automatically call that constructor and make a new user, which brings me into constructors. What the crap is a constructor? It's just a special function that's going to give us a new user. So inside of our class definition, we have a special function that has the same name as the class and what it's going to do is it's going to create a new user and make sure its state is appropriate. So we can set the person's name, we can set their email or whatever inside of this function. So that's going to be called every single time a new user is instantiated. It's a special example of a method, which are just functions attached to objects. So we can create other functions on here like speak, like as if it's a dog or something, but whatever. You can say speak or you could say jump or whatever you might want it to be. So those are methods, but you can also just have data members. So for example, you could have a string called name and that can be used to store data, the person's name. Now a really cool thing you can do is operator overloading. For example, if you do five and then do the comparison operator with five, this makes sense because five equals five is true. It just, it makes sense to us logically. But what about this? What if we wanted to compare user one to user two? Now it doesn't really make so much sense. But what we can do is we could actually overload this operator to basically describe how to compare users. So we can basically make our type work as if it's any other type and define that functionality. So we might be able to say, hey, these two are equal if they have the same first and last name or if they have the same email. Whatever you want it to be, it's totally up to you. That's just one operator overload that I've talked about, but you can also overload the plus operator or any other operator you might know of. So that's what we're also going to be getting into. It's very, very cool and very important. And the last thing I wanted to talk about is static members. Static members are not associated with each object, but instead describe the class in general. So if we wanted to have something that described all of the users, we could label it as static and it would stay associated with the class. So for example, you could have number of users. So and then any time a user was created, we could increase that. And any time a, a user was destroyed, we could decrease that. Kind of think of it like if you had a cookie cutter and etched on the side of it how many times you made a cookie, <laughs> that would essentially be a static member because it's tied with the cookie cutter, the class. So yeah, this is very conceptual content, but hopefully in the next video, we can make this concrete by going through some examples. Now, if you watch the videos on structs, this is probably me saying the same thing for the fifth time, but structs and classes are very similar. But by convention, we'll use classes for things that are more complex than structs for things that are very simple. So generally, if you're going to use methods, you would use a class. If it's just some simple data, you can use a struct. So now that we've talked a little bit about the convention between structs and classes, let's go into the next video and create a class and give it some features that might be unique to classes, something you would see with classes, specifically methods and getters and setters and stuff like that. That's what we're gonna be getting into here soon. So check out the next video and please be sure to subscribe if this video helped you out. And let me know if there's ever been a situation where at the time you thought something was completely useless, but looking back, you're thankful you paid attention and learned it, such as multiplication. <laughs> All right, thank you guys. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.